Hi, greetings. Um, I'm David Christensen. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs here at Family Research Council. We want to welcome you to a uh, member lecture series today uh, on the issue of the Conscience Protection Act. Please welcome uh, Dr. John Fleming. He is, let me give you a little background, he is Congressman from Louisiana's 4th Congressional District, elected in 2009. He's currently a candidate for the GOP nominee for the Louisiana open seat uh, later this November. Dr. Fleming is a, uh, you may not know this, is a Navy veteran and a medical doctor. In the House, Dr. Fleming has worked in Congress for sensible health care reforms, in fact, uh, authorizing, authoring legisl legislation requiring that members of Congress participate in the same health care policies that they have foisted on the rest of the American uh, public. Dr. Fleming serves on the very powerful and influential Armed Services Committee and the Natural Resources Committee, where he is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Water, Power, and Oceans. Dr. Fleming is the co-chair of the GOP's Doctors' Caucus, a group with 14 physicians who work on patient-centered health care reforms. He's also the co-chair of the Values Action Team. Um, Dr. Fleming is uh, married to his wife, Cindy, for 37 years. Did I get that right? Oh, 38 years. Okay, congratulations. Uh, he knows the importance of life and family. His uh, a father of four children and a grandfather, I think, of three. Um, and uh, he's also a doctor who has delivered hundreds of, of babies. In uh, 2007, he was named Louisiana Family Doctor of the Year. And during his time in Congress, uh, Dr. Fleming has championed religious freedom provisions, as well as conscience protections for mer medical personnel who do not want, because of conscience, to participate in abortion. So he is the sponsor of the Conscience Protection Act, and we'll talk about the importance of conscience protections for health care providers. Please welcome Dr. Fleming. <laughs> Okay, great to be with you today, and uh, it's exciting. You know, uh, it's interesting uh, that at the beginning of the health care debate, uh, Obamacare, which it turned out to be later, uh, and the resolution I had that doctors should have to participate in whatever work product we come out with, which turned out to be Obamacare. And uh, we sort of are, but we sort of aren't, which is interesting. But we've come up with a new idea. And I, which I really like, that we should require Congress, members of Congress, to participate in the VA hospital system. Wouldn't that be nice? And then we can stand in line like everybody else until we get it fixed. So it is important that we have equity in health care. But, you know, one of the issues that came up very early in the discussion on the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, was are we going to protect life? Are we going to protect conscience rights? And we had big battles over that and we were given certain uh, promises that this administration would in fact protect those rights and as it turns out they never have. Uh, we have something called the Weldon Amendment that uh, was put, which is actually a year-to-year -year rider that's on appropriations bills. We've had this for, for a number of years and its purpose is to prevent the discrimination against health care providers and others who may be forced uh, because of their deeply held beliefs, their conscience, to do things against that violates that conscience, their religious beliefs. And uh, that is law. There's no question about it. The problem is that today uh, Health and Human Services refuses to enforce that law. So those, those uh, those promises that were made by the Obama administration that they would protect life and protect, uh, protect conscience uh, did not materialize. So uh, in 2011, I introduced a bill uh, that was then called ANDA, the Abortion Non-Discrimination Act, that would give a private right of action. That is to say that if Health and Human Services is not going to step up and, and protect health care providers and also people who by insurance policies that may actually cover abortions, elective abortions. If they're not protected from that, then they can go to court and fight over that. Uh, and we've been working on this, again, since 2011. So far, we've not been able to uh, get it up for a vote, but we're, we're very hopeful that we can do it this year. 
We've changed the name to Conscience Protection Act, CPA, uh, and I think that's a more appropriate name for it. Uh, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's high time that we do that, make it permanent law that either the government does what it's supposed to do and enforce its own laws, or you can go to courts. Now, let me give you some examples of why this is necessary. In August 22, 2014, the California Department for Managed uh, Health Care uh, created a mandate that essentially says that all insurance policies must have coverage for elective abortions. And so whether you're a church, whether uh, you're a private business, whether you're an individual, you're being forced today in California to purchase health plans that would cover abortions. And uh, that's, again, your dollars that are going to subsidize and support that. And uh, as, a, as a Christian myself, as someone who believes in the sanctity of life, someone who believes that life begins at conception, and I think I ought to know about that. I'm a physician. You know, the president said that was above his pay grade. Well, I can tell you it's not above my pay grade. I know when life begins. In fact, I would say to you this, and this is an important technical argument. Remember that at the moment of conception, there's an admix of DNA that is unique, unless you have a, a, a identical twin. But otherwise, throughout history and throughout the future, there will never be anyone with your exact DNA blueprint. That happens at the moment of conception. So you are special, and of course we know the Bible says that you're special and you're known by God even before the birth from your mother's womb. So anyway, getting back to this, it's important that people in California and other states have the ability to go to court. And I mean, again, that not that the American way that you can go to the America's courts to find relief when you're being forced to do something against your own conscience? But it even goes deeper than that. Let me tell you about Kathy DiCarlo. Several years ago, Kathy, as a nurse, was forced as, as a pro-life nurse to participate in an abortion against her will. Now, uh, it wasn't just an ordinary abortion. This was a later term abortion and she had to witness and participate with the dismemberment of the baby in its mother's womb. Now again, uh, let, let's, let's be frank about this. Uh, baby develops very early, hands, feet, eyes, heart begins to beat around nine weeks. And when you're doing an abortion on a fetus or unborn baby, then uh, it gets more and more technically difficult. In fact, uh, you remember um, the abortionist in Philadelphia who it became so problematic when he did abortions late term that he decided to induce the delivery of the baby and then kill the baby afterwards. So you see, when you're doing an abortion beyond a certain stage, particularly the first trimester, then you have to dismember that baby. And she had to participate in that act. And she has the psychological scars of that today. And I can assure you there's no treatment for PS, PTSD for her today, uh, assistance from the government. Uh, even though she had to participate one time, she made a big deal out of it, as she should, and she was not any longer forced to do that. But other health care providers going forward are going to be, and perhaps are even today. Maybe they're suffering quietly, but they are being forced to participate in one way or another with abortions. I'll give you my own case. I'm not sure how well it applies to my bill, Conscious Protection Act, but I myself um, have had young ladies come to my office on my doorstep seeking health as a result of a complication of their abortion. You see, I didn't refer this young lady for an abortion. She gets the abortion, and where is the abortionist? Well, he or she flew in and then flew right back out. So I was left to deal with the complications. Well, I had mixed feelings about that. I certainly, as a physician, wanted to help the young lady and would do anything I could. But on the other hand, am I not in some way enabling that behavior that there's always a backstop, somebody to take care of somebody? And that's why a number of states, including Louisiana, are passing laws that says if you're going to do abortions, 
like any other healthcare procedure, you need to be available for the complications. You need to have hospital privileges so you can deal with them. Uh, so it's important that we deal with all of these uh, important issues. Um, in New York, uh, there's a pattern very similar to California of an abortion mandate. The New, New York State insurance regulators are requiring that employer-sponsored insurance plans include abortion. And this is affecting, um, again, uh, Catholic and other religious organizations. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Albany has filed suit. But you see under the Weldon, uh, they've, they've filed suit, but, but they don't have private right of action because the government is supposed to be there for you when you're forced to do things against your will. And we just found out very recently, I, get, I found out only today, that Illinois now has passed a law from the House and the Senate, I don't think it's been signed yet, which would force medical facilities and physicians to refer women for abortions in certain circumstances. Again, I, 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 it's beyond me that any health care pro provider would be forced or mandated to do that. So in conclusion, um, I'm here to discuss today, and I'll be happy to take questions, the Conscience Protection Act, H.R. 4828, uh, I will tell you that our leadership is very interested in this, the House leadership. Paul Ryan specifically uh, has indicated many times he's very interested in moving this. But I think it takes a groundswell of support from the country in order to get this done. So I would ask everyone here today and those who may be listening or viewing this to become engaged on this. Reach out to the Speaker's office. Uh, let them hear from you because uh, the more support they have, uh, the more likely they are to act. And I'll say parenthetically that what has been so heartwarming to me is that over the years, particularly since Roe v. Wade, the increasing number of people who are now pro-life, now a majority of Americans are pro-life for the first time since Roe v. Wade, and most of it is coming from young people. Isn't that amazing? Uh, that's so heartwarming to me. I'm so glad that the next generation is going to take up the cause and move that forward. Uh, but we need to act. We need legislative relief, and that's why I present to you today the Conscious Protection Act. I would ask that you support it and that you reach out to those who can vote for it and to our leadership who will advance it in the House. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for that quick question. You have heard um, some people kind of throw a critical uh, criticism at, at conscience protection or particularly uh, your bill and say that uh, this is going to allow, um, you know, hospitals, whether it's a Catholic hospital or, you know, religious uh, doctor to not provide treatment for a woman um, who may be in some sort of a complication. Can you, you kind of started to address that a little bit, but um, some, of the, some of the Democrats have kind of leveled those charges and mm -hmm. just wanted to get you to maybe uh, respond to that. Right. Well, again, I can approach this whole question of what about the life of the mother uh, from a technical standpoint as a physician who's delivered hundreds of babies uh, and, and every single time uh, it was a happy, happy occasion. I, I loved doing it. And, um, and I was there for all four of mine uh, that were born. Um, it was such a wonderful experience. I can't think of anything uh, that involves the human body that's any more important and any more rewarding than to be part of the delivery of a new ward, maybe. Uh, but you see, if you don't protect the life of the mother, then you can't protect the life of the baby. And that's what somehow gets lost in the debate, that somehow we're going to snatch the baby out of the womb and let the mother die. Well, that's ridiculous. I've been involved in a number of, of complicated obstetrical cases, and I can't tell you a single time where that was ever an issue. It's always about keeping the baby in the mother's womb as long as we can, because that's the safest place for the baby, until conditions are such that the baby is better off outside of the womb. And whether it's a Catholic hospital, I, and I've practiced in a Catholic hospital before, or whether you're talking about uh, any ordinary facility, 
this is not an issue of exclusions, you know, that somehow that we've got to exclude uh, the life of the mother. That's, that's not even part of the debate. We, all of us, who are 100% pro-life, believe that the baby's life is only protected when we're taking care of the mother as well. So I hope that clears that up. I think that that's, that's really a spin on the issue and meant to uh, sort of blur the lines of distinction there. Yes. Hi, I'm Dr. Marguerite Duena, family physician faculty at Georgetown, and I agree wholeheartedly. One of the greatest privileges as a family doctor is being there to care for pregnant women, and we, we do. We care for them both. Typically, the, the complicated referrals for abortion happen late term when, like you said, you keep them in as long as you can, but yeah. abortion isn't the answer. If you need to do early delivery, you do early delivery. You save right. them both. My question has to do with the California legisl uh, yeah. legislation or the, the health right. insurance and while it's wonderful we've got a court system to fight, a lot of people don't want to fight. They just want to find another alternative. Yeah. In California, is there the option of using the, the health sharing ministries, like Samaritan Ministries? My understanding is that the Obamacare Act has an exemption for health sharing ministries, mm -hmm. like Samaritan Ministries for Christians and Christ Medicus Foundation, which is a Catholic health sharing ministry. Is that an option, and what can we do to make more people aware of it, like the small businesses or the small faith-based organizations that, you know, mm. may not have the resources to fight, right. you know, the, the, the California um, state, uh, state, but would rather right. just find a positive alternative. So sure. is, is that an option? Uh, that is an option, um, the, the, the uh, sort of exemption for faith-based programs um, that apply not just to obstetrics but to others is an option but it's so narrowly defined that I don't think it escapes all of the problems that we run into here because again that wouldn't help the nurse who is forced to participate. Uh, that wouldn't help uh, maybe the young resident who's uh, required even to provide birth control even though he or she may be Catholic and feel like it's against his or her conscience rights. So I, I think that is an option and something some, if somebody really is committed to avoiding even one dollar going for an elective abortion that they can entertain. Uh, but you see, uh, the way HHS uh, approaches this is that um, it is sort of pro-abortion until determined otherwise. And uh, so you, you, you really have to have very, very narrow, specific interpretations uh, to find relief. The average person out there, that's not an option. Maybe they have a job, and the only option for health care is their employer's health care plan. So that just maybe wouldn't be practical for them. So, uh, but, but I think that's certainly uh, one option available and an important one. Yes, sir, you have a question. Hi, thank you for being with us, Dr. Fleming. Uh, my question is about... Well, the HHS issued a final regulation where they spoke about redefining sex discrimination to include even things like gender identity. And that has been said to possibly be amount to forcing doctors to become involved in, you know, anything from, you know, sex reassignment surgeries to other things that would violate their consciences and mm -hmm. their understanding of best medical practices. Yeah. This isn't explicitly related to CPA, but what do we do, you know, about, about these sort of things? How do we fight back against uh, this infringement on the rights of doctors to practice medicine in accordance with their beliefs and good medicine? Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a very um, murky future for us in this gender, gender identity question uh, because, um, you know, we're talking about uh, anything from sports, boys and girls, who can play soccer with girls or softball with girls and with boys. Um, it's, it's really becoming a, a landmine, uh, a minefield, so to speak, and we're going to have to work through this or get clarification from the next president. Remember, this is mostly coming from the president's executive orders, and hopefully the next president will clear that up and make it much more straight, straightforward for us in this. But, uh, yeah, it's going to going to create a lot of questions going forward. Thank you. Um, 
Dr. Fleming, I also appreciate you being here. I think that one of the questions that some folks might have is how CPA interacts with, for example, Roe v. Wade and Casey and some of the Supreme Court precedent. I think some folks may wonder whether it is an attempt to overturn that or it's an attempt to just provide mm -hmm. a margin for doctors to kind of practice in a safe space. Right. Well, uh, the, the question is important. How does it affect Roe v. Wade, or does it affect Roe v. Wade? How does it affect abortions at all? And the answer is, it really has no direct effect on abortions. Uh, when it comes to a person who may choose that option, it does not prevent in any way to do that. All this does is it, it discusses the option of the person who may have to participate, may be forced to participate in an abortion, uh, there are plenty of people out there willing and anxious to participate in abortions. So this is about respecting the right of conscience. This is a First Amendment, which may be the most, perhaps, important amendment in our Constitution. Your ability to have access to your belief and not to be discriminated because of your belief and also to express your belief. And if that expression is, hey, I'm not going to participate in an abortion, you have a perfect right to do that. But that doesn't mean that there aren't thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people out there who are willing to do that. So it has no effect at all on one's access if that is what someone chooses to have an abortion. This is all about protecting the rights of a person from having to participate in some way with something that they just frankly don't believe in. We have the... Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, first of all, thank you so much for introducing this legislation. I, I applaud you. Um, and I ask you as a physician, and I'm not sure if you're a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians, um, but I look at, you know, the AMA now used to be opposed to assisted suicide, and now they're going to study the issue. Um, I have been a member of the AAFP and seriously considered leaving it about two mm -hmm. years ago when they passed a resolution saying that, all forms of emergency uh, emergency contraception, i.e. the morning after pill, should be available to all females without a prescription mm -hmm. of reproductive age, i.e. a 12-year-old should be able to walk into a CVS and pick up the morning right. after pill. So my question is, is how do we get our specialty organizations, the organizations that theoretically are supposed to be representing us as physicians, um, to, to, to come back? I mean, I've, I've been... I've been a member of the AAFP and on their board as, even as a student, so very involved in leadership, mm -hmm. and it's been very disheartening to see it be taken over by a very mm -hmm. liberal part mm -hmm. of our specialty where right. it's pushing, you know, two years ago they passed a resolution that uh, support of gay marriage. I'm like, how is that even an issue relevant to family mm -hmm. physicians? But so how do, with your Healthcare Conscience Act, what are you doing to reach out to these specialty organizations? How do we get them on board? I know the Catholic Medical Association is going to have their national conference in right. Washington, D.C. this fall. Like, how do we make those members aware to bring physicians on board to say, you know, we mm -hmm. as doctors want our ability to practice medicine without having to sacrifice um, sure. the practice of our faith? Right. Uh, great, great question. I am a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians. I'm board certified uh, by the, uh, the American board. And uh, yes, um, uh, we, we are seeing this among the various medical professions. Uh, and to be honest with you, um, this is a real struggle when it comes to issues about life, about protecting conscience, uh, because many people are so practical minded from day to day. They think in terms of what we do here in Washington is really all about making sure that the trains run on time and roads are built and uh, budgets are passed. And little by little, our liberties, our individual liberties are being eroded until all of a sudden one day somebody tells you that you've got to do something or you can't do something that you thought you could. And then you go, well, what have those knuckleheads been doing in Washington? And that question more and more is being asked. So I would say that uh, I get very little in, you know, I meet with these, these uh, physician groups all the time. And uh, they never bring these types of issues up at all. And I think it's because it's not being brought up from the field. 
if that's an area you think that needs to be addressed, then you're, you and your colleagues, and I'm sure you do, but many of your colleagues need to make, make sure that there's a critical mass of interest in these areas. Uh, and, and it's increasingly important because, you know, healthcare is, uh, and for physicians and healthcare workers, it's not just about being a mechanic. Uh, we're dealing with, with humans and we're dealing with very important issues. And it's going to get more complex with time. Think about what our scientific capabilities are. We're actually being able to create organs. Uh, they're experimenting with uh, or, uh, creating organs within animal models. And what is that application? And of course, we had the stem cell debate back about eight or 10 years ago. And we have great hope for the future for stem cells. Luckily, it turns out the adult stem cells are actually the more effective direction to go, which means we don't have to sacrifice embryos in the name of stem cell research. So these are all extremely important areas. And uh, to be honest with you, I think the health profession and the organizations are not engaging nearly at the level they should. But I, I appreciate your sensitivity to that. We need a lot more folks like you, doctor. Dr. Fleming, what can people watching the, um, this lecture online, what can people do to help uh, in the context of the legislation, CPA? What, what do you recommend? What are some practical things that mm -hmm. uh, folks out there can, can do? Yes. You need to pull out your iPhone <laughs> or your smartphone, in case it's not an iPhone, but your smartphone. And there's a lot of things you can do. You can email your representative or your senator. You can call their offices. You can call the office of the speaker. Give them encouragement. I can tell you that one thing you won't find a lot of in Washington is courage. And it takes courage to get these things done, quite frankly, because what representatives and senators have to go through in order to get these things into law can be very brutal. So don't expect a lot of, uh, uh, among a large group a lot of activity unless they know you have their back or they know you have their back. So uh, the bottom line on this, get active, get activated. Uh, if you're working through an organization, a pro-life organization or anything that can really focus or has, you know, e email addresses that can activate people in your sphere of life, all of those things are very important. But if enough people reach out to members of Congress, particularly the House at this point. If enough members do that, it will be brought up and it will be voted on and it will be passed. And um, again, we're going to have a new president next year and we could get it signed into law, I think, uh, based on what you do here today and what people around you do, people in your lives. Okay, great. Uh, we have a very uh, erudite group here. I, I want to thank you for all of those very uh, important uh, questions, fundamental questions. And uh, please stay in touch with my office. Uh, you have uh, Katie Doherty back there, who is my uh, medical ledge, who works with us on all these issues of life and conscience. Uh, as David said, I'm uh, co-chairman of the Values Actions Team, where we deal with these issues uh, weekly, and we interact with uh, other members and, and, and certainly other organizations out there, right to life organizations and Catholic organizations, Baptist, other religious organizations, and others who just have the interest in talking about life and good outcomes. So I want to thank you all for being here today, and I look forward to uh, communicating with you in the future. Thank you, and God bless.